Hello everyone, welcome back. So in today's video, we'll take a look at some more problems from various chapters. So the first question is from magnetism. So the problem statement is we have a uniform magnetic field of field strength B that runs parallel to the axis of a long insulating cylindrical shell whose radius is B. A charged particle with mass M and charge Q is initially positioned at a distance of A away from the axis of the cylinder. Now the particle is launched with a speed of V in an arbitrary direction. What is the minimum time T for the particle to reach the wall of the cylinder. Okay, so that's the problem. Give this a try guys and then check out the solution. So let's begin by observing the view along the axis of the cylinder and I'm considering the magnetic field to be out of the page. So the particle is at some particular point at a distance of A from the axis of the cylinder. Okay, and now we are about to project this particle. Now, now they did not mention the direction in which we are projecting. That is a variable that we have to keep in mind. So all the other parameters are actually fixed in this problem, which means once the pro once a particle is projected, it's going to move in a circular trajectory because we are projecting the particle perpendicular to the magnetic field, right? So, and the radius of the orbit, we can just calculate using the formula of mv over qb. Okay, and once you substitute all the values in, this turns out to be 20 meters. Okay, so now we know the particle moves in a circular path whose radius is actually 20 meters. Now in the question, our goal was to minimize the time it takes for the particle to escape the cylindrical region. So let's just take an arbitrary situation. So like in this situation, so let's say the particle travels along a curve, something like this. The center of the path would be, let's say somewhere over here. So I'm not drawing to scale. I'm just drawing a random trajectory just to understand the situation. So this is the center of that particular circle in which the particle is moving. And this is the radius R. Okay. So now what is the time it takes for the particle to cover this distance that will be equal to this particular distance divided by the speed V, right? So the time T is just going to be whatever that arc length is, let's say it is L divided by V. Now this arc length, I can write it in terms of this particular angle theta as r theta divided by v. So what we are observing is that the time it takes for the particle to escape is proportional to the subtended angle theta. Now if I connect the initial point to the exit point um, and observe this particular chord over here, the length of this chord is proportional to this angle theta. Right, so if the length of the chord is d, I can write d as 2r sine of theta by 2. So we can directly see that the length of the chord is actually directly proportional to the angle theta. Now, if our goal is to minimize theta, what we need to focus on is minimizing the distance d. And that is pretty easy to understand. So if you draw all the possible chords, it's very easy to understand that the chord with the smallest length is this particular chord over here, which is parallel to this vector basically. Okay. And this distance we can determine using the given uh, value. So A was given to be 10 meters. The radii of the cylinder was 35 meters. So this length would be 25 meters. Okay. So now we want this to be our chord length. So we have to project the particle something like this so that it covers the trajectory in this fashion. So center will be somewhere over here. Okay, we don't really need to draw the exact situation because the question is pretty much done here. So the value of D is 25, 2R will be 40, and this would be equal to sine of theta by two. Okay, so once we determine the value of theta, now we can just substitute everything into the time expression. And the answer for the time turns out to be around 1.35 seconds. So yeah, that's the answer to this question. Now let's move on to the next one. Okay, so in this question, we have a hexagonal shaped room that are covered with flat mirrors. A lamp is lit in the middle of the room. How many images does the lamp produce? Okay, so the question is a bit incomplete. So these three are the plane mirrors. Okay, and the other three walls of the room are actually non reflecting. You can consider them as light absorbing or light transmitting doesn't matter. So they just don't reflect light. So and now we have a lamp at the, in the middle of the room exactly. So we have to figure out how many images are formed in this situation. Okay. So yeah, that's the question. Now let's discuss the problem. 
Okay, so to begin with, we have three mirrors over here. Mirror number one, mirror number two, and mirror number three. So, so first let's discuss about mirror number one. So if we talk about the incident rays on the first mirror, there are going to be some rays, for example, a ray like this. So there are going to be rays of this type, which after being incident on the first mirror, are not incident on mirror number two or three. So these rays after striking the mirror, go back and hit the back wall, after which it does not get reflected back. Okay, so there are going to be a bunch of rays similar to the first ray that I just drew. Okay, now of course rays like this would uh, appear as if they're coming from a point behind the mirror. Okay, and using simple plane mirror image formation, we know that it forms at this particular distance is such that these two distances uh, are actually equal, right? Okay, so, so let's first depict that uh, image. So an easier way to just depict that image would be to just copy paste this hexagon and place it over here. So that way we directly have the image over here. We don't really have to, you know, do the equal distance thing. So this is going to be, let's say the first image. So basically all the reflected rays after they are incident on the first mirror will appear to be coming from I1. Okay, so this is the basic plane mirror image formation rules. So, um, so basically what we can do is instead of drawing rays this way, you know, what we can do is we can just directly draw rays from I1 itself. And then we can say that these are the reflected rays. So this ray would correspond to this incident ray. This reflected ray would correspond to this incident ray and so on. Right. Okay. So now if you observe the first image, something that we can observe is there are rays that never get reflected again, like these rays over here. And then there are rays that, you know, are incident on the third mirror. So these are rays like this particular ray, which after being incident on the first mirror, the rays will go intersect the third mirror. So instead of complicating the situation and, you know, drawing the incident ray and the reflected ray, once again, we can use the image I1 as the fake object for the third mirror. So that way we can easily draw the image of I1 with respect to mirror number three. So for that, what we can do is we can extend this plane mirror, uh, this plane mirror number three. And now by using the plane mirror uh, image formation rule, we can say that if this distance is D, the image will be formed at another distance of D. And just to tidy things up a bit, we can draw another hexagon. Let's say this distance is X. So the image will once again be formed at another, at another distance of X. So we can just draw another hexagon. Okay, something like this. So what we did so far is first we discussed that the direct light rays after reflection from the first mirror uh, appear to come from the, uh, this point I1. And then we discussed that some of these light rays after being incident hits the third mirror. And, and after the second reflection, these light rays appear to come from this particular point over here, which we can call I13, stating one is the source, three is the mirror. Okay. So yeah, so now so far we have discussed two particular images. So now let's talk about uh, image formation from the third plane mirror. So exactly the same story continues here. So the direct light rays will appear to come from a point somewhere over here. So we can draw another hexagon for that something like this. So this is going to be, let's say I three. Okay. And similarly, uh, if we draw one more hexagon over here. Okay. And now we have the light rays that are incident on the third mirror, which intercepts the first mirror after reflection. And once again, after reflection, they will appear to be coming from this particular point, just like we discussed the first case. So this is going to be I three one. Okay. I three the source and mirror is number one. So yeah, mirror one and three forms four such images. Okay. Now mirror. Mm, okay. So now let's talk about mirror two. Mirror two is actually pretty simple because no light ray that is incident on the second mirror will be incident on the first or the third mirror. And you can just prove it using simple arguments. So uh, if you observe this angle is 30 degrees, right? And this is the most uh, extreme ray. So this will be reflected. Uh, and this angle is going to be 60 degrees. So if this is 60 degrees 
and uh, if you observe this angle over here is also 60 degrees so, so the extreme ray that is incident on this mirror is basically just parallel to this mirror so no ray that is incident on the second mirror will be incident on the first or the third mirror so mirror 2's image formation is pretty simple so there will be only the direct uh, there will be only one image formed by the direct reflection which will be over here at the same distance d behind the mirror so this is so in this case there will be only one image i2 okay so yeah basically we have covered all possibilities okay so now we have to cover one more important thing uh, and that is the question let's say if we stand at this particular point in the room then how many images can we see versus this point this point this point etc okay so for that we have to see where are the rays reaching so first let's discuss about image one image one actually reaches every corner of the room if you observe okay so you can draw multiple rays and uh, see that it reaches every single corner of the room okay so basically wherever our observer stands in the room if he is looking at mirror one he will definitely see image number one okay similarly if our observer looks at mirror number three he will definitely see i3 okay now what about i2 i2 also has a st similar story right you can just draw multiple light rays and see that all the light rays the light rays span everywhere across the room so all the light rays from the source i2 from the fake source i2 is reaching every corner of the room so wherever the i is placed he will also see i2 so so i1 i2 and i3 can be seen from all points in the room okay okay now what about i13 and i31 so here we have to be a bit careful because not all light rays from the source are real because in the earlier cases we basically said that all these light rays reach all corners of the room but for i13 we cannot draw all the light rays because in the real case not all the light rays are available for example let's say we talk about this light ray okay so this light ray what exactly it is is this particular light ray so after reflection uh, this light ray will look something like this it is this ray that we are actually drawing from i13 this is actually present in the actual case right but let's talk about this light ray so this uh, with this light ray we are talking about this ray okay this is actually not there in reality because there is no ray from i1 that actually reaches mirror 2 so basically all the light rays that are hitting mirror 2 these are not there in the real case okay so the only rays that are actually there is the light rays that are being incident on the third mirror these are real because um, these are basically the second reflection rays right so these are actually real rays but these rays are fake ones okay if we have to summarize the light from the image uh, source i13 will cover this section of the room which is basically half the room because on, it can only enter through mirror number three something like this okay so it can so it can only cover half the room and similarly i3 i31 will cover this particular half so using the exact same logic okay so this is the this is the i13 region and for the i31 region we'll use blue color let's say this is going to be the i31 region so if you observe there is an overlap of a triangular region over here so in this triangular region we can observe image i13 and i31 so if we if we have some observer uh, over here looking at mirror number 3 he can see i13 and if this guy looks at mirror number one he can also see i31 so so if you have an eye at this particular triangular region over here we can see all the five images if we look at the mirrors one by one so in this triangular region we can observe five images uh, if you observe the lower triangular region in the lower triangular region we cannot observe i13 and i31 so here we can only observe three and on the right we can just observe i31 so here we can observe four by symmetry here also we can only observe four so yeah that was the basic story of this question so so basically if we have an observer in the left or the right part they can see four images 
Okay, in this triangular region, we can observe five images and in this region, we can only observe three images. Okay, so yeah, that's about it for this question.